Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, as you all should, or as mentioned when you all joined, your lines are already muted. Um, if you do have questions during the call or after the call, um, please push star six or pound six to unmute your line. Um, and without further ado, Joanne, if you're ready, please take it away on um, bone health and kidney disease. Okay. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Joanne Smith. I'm the DPC Education Manager, and I'm actually sitting in for Dr. Ravel. He was unable to make this um, this presentation today. So we're actually using the presentation from our classroom that you can take a look at if you'd like to in the future. Um, so our presentation today is on how bone health is related to kidney disease. Okay, so our first slide. Chrissy, are you going to get the slides? Oh, I can. I see them right there. I, I can do them. Um, so how is calcium regulated in our body? So when your kidneys start to fail, your parathyroid glands can grow too big. And what they do is they, they produce parathyroid hormone, and they can produce too much thyroid ho hormone. So what happens is when your parathyroid hormone increases, um, this releases calcium and phosphorus from your bones. Um, so with kidney disease, vitamin D in your body cannot be converted to active vitamin D, which can help suppress that calcium. Um, your nephrologist can prescribe vitamin D sterols, so that, that would be Zemplar, Hectorol, um, those type of medicines. Um, they, be, they can be given as a pill or they can be IV through your dialysis machine. And what they do is they enable vitamin D to become active so that your body can use that to help suppress the calcium. So there is a medication to lower your parathyroid hormone levels, and your nephrologist can also prescribe that, and that is a pill to be taken with your largest meal of the day. And, and um, so what happens with that pill is so the thyroid glands, um, if you don't control them, will become enlarged and, con and continue to release phosphorus and calcium. So if you don't take measures to help control the parathyroid level, um, you know, it could be dangerous to your body with your calcium and phosphorus levels. Um, so your level should be drawn, your PTH level or parathyroid hormone level should be drawn quarterly or every three months with your other dialysis labs. Um, so if the glands or the parathyroid glands continue to release too much PTH or parathyroid hormone, the nephrologist may actually order you to have the glands removed, and that's called a parathyroidectomy. We don't see that much anymore. Um, years ago, we used to see that to control phosphorus and calcium and the PTH, that they would actually, um, you know, have surgery on your neck and remove that, um, those glands. So if you can keep, if you can regulate your parathyroid levels, um, less calcium and phosphorus are released from the bones, so that gives you stronger bones. Um, and, and, you know, your vital organs can stay healthy. With that calcium and phosphorus circulating in, in your body, though, pulling from the bones, you get bone weakness and you also get calcification of your organs. So along with your dialysis treatment and the help of a low phosphorus diet that your registered dietitian can help you with and taking your phosphorus binders with your meals, you can um, keep your phosphorus levels within acceptable levels. So this, of course, will make your dietitian and your nephrologist and your body actually very ha um, happy. So your dialysis team realizes that phosphorus is difficult to control. Everything you eat or drink really has phosphorus in it. Um, levels of phosphorus are found in almost everything. The medications to help control the phosphorus can sometimes make you feel sick to your stomach or constipated. So if that happens, be sure to let your team know um, that you're having these symptoms because they can um, order a different binder, um, even Tums they can use as a binder. And so also they can, there's um, liquid binders that they can order as well. Um, so they can change the medication um, to make it easier for you to take. And sometimes they may also um, add a stool softener to your, your medications um, to relieve the constipation. So the importance of vitamin D. So we talked about vitamin D. It helps control um, calcium absorption in your body. Um, so really the only way that we get vitamin D is we get minimal from diet, but we do get it from sun. Um, and people that don't have kidney disease, that vitamin D can be converted to active vitamin D, but people with kidney disease, that cannot happen. 
So um, the vitamin D sterols are what allows your vitamin D to be activated. Um, and so what they do, uh, they help lower your parathyroid hormone levels and control the calcium absorption. Okay. So what is the danger of high calcium in your blood? So we'll talk low calcium first. So low ca calcium levels in your bones. Of course, you can imagine your, your bones are rich with calcium. Um, lower levels of, of calcium in your bones cause them to weaken. So you can have bone pain. Um, your bones will easily fracture and break. Um, we've had people that have come to the clinic or have had hip fractures or hip, broken hips. Um, from sneezing. Um, so on the flip side, excessive calcium and phosphorus that gets in your blood can be deposited in soft tissue, like your lungs, your eyes, your heart, and your blood vessels. Um, so this would increase the risk of stroke and heart, heart attacks, um, and also decrease the likelihood of a kidney transplant. Um, so if you would go in for a kidney transplant and they would start the surgery, and if they opened you up, if they would see calcification in your organs, that decreases the ability of circulation to that brand new kidney, so they certainly probably, you know, would not want to transplant you at that time. So what's the deal with phosphorus? High phosphorus levels in your blood draw calcium out of your bones. Phosphorus binders taken with meals as ordered in a low phosphorus diet and dialysis keep those levels from rising to a dangerous level. Phosphorus Phosphate binders can cause constipation, like we said. So if constipation does occur, um, if you stay constipated, your levels will stay high because you're truly not getting rid of the phosphorus, right? It kind of makes sense. Um, high phosphorus foods, um, I, I guess most people probably know, are dairy products, colas, nuts, chocolates, and those types of foods. Um, binders come in a variety of sizes and shapes. Um, so you really need to choose what suits you best. And, and, you know, like I said earlier, if you're having a hard time, I know some of the binders are rather large and you have to chew them up. Um, you know, it kind of decreases your appetite and sometimes they make you constipate it. Um, you know, but like I said, make sure that you tell the nephrologist or the dietitian or the nurse um, and so they can switch up your binder to either pill or liquid form. Um, so, you know, like I said, it's really, really important that you take those binders to keep your bones and your heart healthy. So what can be done if your doctor tells you that you have high levels of PTH in your blood? So I said earlier, there's a medication that can take, be taken once a day with your largest meal, and that's called Sinicalcet. Um, and what Sinicalcet does is, is, you can see here, it lowers the PTH, it lowers the calcium, and it lowers the phosphorus. Um, so it does have some side effects. A lot of people will say that, you know, they have some nausea, um, you know, an upset stomach, uh, maybe some vomiting. Um, it does take a little while for your body to get used to the Sinecal set. So if you can hang in there and honestly take it with your largest meal, it will help control your PTH levels. It's, it's really a really good medication. Med red medication. Um, so you should have your PTH levels drawn at least every three months. Um, and if your, P if your Sinecal set dose changes, um, your, your dialysis clinic should maybe wait a week and then draw your phosphorus and potassium again, or phosphorus and calcium again, to see where your levels are. Um, if your calcium level would drop too much, they would want to hold that Sinecal set, um, you know, until it came up to a normal level. So that, like I said, the Sinecal set also helps reduce phosphorus levels as well as the PTH. So here's the deal. Here's how everything is connected, right? So you have um, vitamin D that comes in through the liver, and it's, it's converted to active vitamin D, and it bypasses the kidneys in, in CKD patients. But phosphorus and other factors um, go through the gut and through the intestines, and then you are able to make active vitamin D. And what it does is it goes to the parathyroid glands and suppresses them, so it suppresses the level of PTH, and it also suppresses the level of, of calcium coming from the bone, and also helps with phosphorus levels as well. So that decreases the calcification risk in your heart. So how do we keep our bones healthy? Um, exercise 
is one of the key lifestyle changes that you can make to improve the health of your bones. Regular bouts of low impact stress strength training can improve your bone density um, and reduce the risk of fractures. Given the relationship between exercise and bone health, it's no surprise that doctors often recommend exercise to treat or prevent ailments related to the bone, such as osteoporosis. Benefits to bone structure um, during exercise, when you pull muscles against the bones, they actually promote the growth. The tension created from the pull of the muscle triggers the body to increase the bone's density. The bone density of young adults may increase through exercise by up to 8% in one year, according to the University of Maryland Medical Center. Especially before the ages of 25 to 30, regular exercise can strongly affect bone development resulting in a denser and stronger overall structure. Even after your formative years have passed, regular exercise can continue to have the same positive effect improving bone density and strength. And, and exercise could just mean a walk around the block, walking the dog, um, a, a stationary bicycle. Um, it doesn't have to be weight lifting, um, although if you could lift real light weights, that would help as well. Walking, like in water, um, is real beneficial. Um, you know, that, that helps with bone density as well. Um, so note, you should really know your levels. Your phosphorus level should be between 3.0 and 5.5. Your calcium level should be less than or at 10.2. And your PTH levels um, should be between 150 and less than 600. Um, take your prescribed binders with meals and snacks. Even when you eat out, you should bring your binders with you. Um, vitamin D by injection at the dialysis or oral medications given by your nephrologist. nephrologist. And Sinical set if your physician or nephrologist orders that for you. And that's to be taken with the largest meal if ordered. Um, can really keep your bones as healthy as possible for um, dialysis patients. Um, I know um, the presentation's a little bit short. But I actually have two registered dietitians here with me today, um, and they can answer um, any questions that you guys might have. Does anybody have anything? And remember to unmute your line, push star six or pound six. And if you are listening Hello? to the webinar, oh yes, please. Could, um, could you give some ideas of options for fast food, um, hamburger versus uh, chicken sandwich. Uh, um, kind of from a, a Thai perspective for a working person <clears throat> that needs to look for fast food choices. It used to be easier to answer that question um, than it is now because there are phosphorus preservatives in most things. Um, but there are, you know, updated lists. Um, are we able to? Yeah. Excuse me for a second. Yes. Yeah. If we had them. to. Yeah. So um, we can look for something and then send it out to you. I mean, in the past, I would recommend like the um, chicken sandwich, um, or the, you know, the non-breaded type, or um, the Arby's roast beef. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Um, and, or places like um, Subway where you can get like the roast beef sandwich. What type of places did you go? Subway is a choice. Arby's? Yeah, yeah like Subway. Subway. Yeah, Subway. Yes. Um, and, uh, and Arby's. Um, no. Yeah, like a tuna fish sandwich also would be good. So. Okay, and places like um, like McDonald's, is there a, cho a good choice there? Um, yeah, it, it's harder to find something there. I know they've been trying to make some changes, but um, let me look into it. Thank you. So if you would just leave, uh, Christy, your email address, we can send you out some information. Okay. 
You ready? Anyone else? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Dwayne. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dwayne. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I have been experimenting with um, moving toward a more whole health diet, uh, which includes uh, eating a lot of greens um, and um, more nuts and um, legumes. Um, my my potassium has stayed well under control. My phosphorus is the difficult part. Um, so uh, my question is is that um, oftentimes a, a dialysis diet is not a whole healthy diet, and it's not good for our overall health. And so I'm trying to have a, a diet that's more overall healthy that includes good uh, vegetable proteins like nuts and legumes, um, but how can I do that and still keep my phosphorus under check? Um, I had a patient who did a similar type of thing, and what I found is that sometimes what we think of as a healthy portion for nuts is more than what we really need. So if, um, what, how many nuts do you think you would have for a snack? Um, a large handful? I would, say, I would say a little more than a handful, maybe a quarter cup. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, nuts are really packed with a lot of nutrition. So even if you cut back on that portion, you're still going to get the benefits that you're looking for. Um, one of the nuts that we've been really encouraging are Brazil nuts. And I believe okay. to get enough of selenium from them, it was two, mm -hmm. two, two of those Brazil nuts a day. More so, than enough, yeah. so yeah, I mean one to two is is plenty of that. So um, that's what I would recommend. Because everything else that you're doing sounds great, but okay. nuts are so high in phosphorus. Um, so, and the yeah. same thing goes with legumes, like beans or um, lentils. Like half a cup is equal to like three ounces of meat as far as the phosphorus is concerned. And half a cup is not much. So again, portion control becomes really important when, you know, when you look at nuts or any kind of legumes. And also, if you're prescribed binders, you want to make sure when you're taking nuts, even if it's like a small snack, you want to take your binder with it. Well, definitely, I want to take my binders, and I, I still have to be more diligent about taking my binders, but I'm, I'm pretty good about it. Um, I, I, like I said, I did want to expand my diet. Has your nephrologist ordered more than one type of binder? Yes. Um, I'm actually up now. I'm taking Renvella, and I'm taking seven tablets per meal. Uh, pretty high up there, and it, it, it mostly kept it under control. But I, I, I was a 6.3 my last um, um, test. What's your PTH level? Actually, uh, it, it's gone down to like I think it was 236. Okay. Oh, good. And when do you take your binders usually? Do you take it with your meal, before, or after your meal? Just before the meal. Sometimes we tell people to split it up um, throughout the meal. So because oh, really? Thought that yeah. it might cover more of what you're eating. Um, okay. Do you have diabetes? No. No. Okay. Yeah, like take one with the first bite, and maybe you know with the next few bites, like another one. Like just throughout your meal, spread out your binders, especially if you have to take seven. Oh, okay. That's new. I hadn't heard that before. Okay, I'll try it that way. Thank you. I have a question coming through on the chat through the webinar. Um, Kimberly was wondering, um, or she mentioned that she's having high PGH levels on her Sensapar and wanted to know if there were any other suggestions. And then there was also um, a question on using Valforo and other um, med opportun or med options. Okay, so you said there was an issue with high PTH and the patient is on Sensapar? Yes. Um, do they have high phosphorus as well? 
Not that I'm, I'm, she's typing. <laughs> oh, there it is. I continue to have to Well, sometimes, you know, we have patients that have high PTH or unsensitive power, but it's, a lot of times it's high phosphorus that tends to drive up the PTH. So a lot of times when the phosphorus gets controlled, the PTH tends to turn down as well. So it could be that uh, maybe they need an, an adjusting in their Sensipar dose. Maybe they need to be on a higher dose. Maybe they need vitamin D. So there's different aspects to it. Sensipar is not the only thing that's going to help the PTH. And is she taking it with her largest meal? And, and has she had a recent increase in the dose? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Yes, on high phosphorus, okay. Yeah. So many things go into um, controlling the PGH, um, including like how long have you been on dialysis? Did you have a transplant? Uh, so, I mean, what we have to work with is are, are controlling the phosphorus and um, being consistent with taking the Sensipar. I have um, several patients who have trouble with that. So. Mm -hmm. You know, if you miss a couple doses a week, that can really affect your PTH level. I, I got a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch the conversation like 180 degrees. I'm a post-transplant patient recently, within months. I'm, what's your suggestion for the transition now, food-wise? You know, my diet was on dialysis for five years. Now I find myself out there two months in the trans, you know, post transplant. What do you recommend for for a start out diet? Have you have you had recent blood work? I mean, yes, I get blood work every every Monday. My numbers look like they're they're good. Uh, I really haven't been on any kind of special diet or anything, you know, or any special food or. I mean, you know, the advice was, hey, you just go back to what you did before transplant, but, uh, I mean, you know, before dialysis. But I, I thought, you had any recommendations on, on you know, somebody post-transplant on how you start back? I would just um, go back to what you ate before if it was a healthy diet. If it wasn't a healthy diet, then look into eating you know, just a more general heart-healthy diet. Um, but one thing that I would make sure that they check is your PTH level because we see a lot of people come back to us that have high PTH levels. All right. What 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 num what kind of numbers am I looking for in that PTH level? Because I get like I said, I get tested every week. Yeah, like hundred and not trending up. So if they're checking it, you know, regularly, just kind of keep keep tabs on how it's changing. Already. So, so you wouldn't recommend any one food rather than the other, or stay away from this for a while, or no, enjoy. Yeah, yeah. Well, the most part is a liberal diet after transplant. So, yeah, right, healthy, I, lean meats, vegetables, fruits. What, what's so hard is you got to follow all the rules on dialysis. Then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're ready to come back, and uh, you know it's, it's like the whole world's out there again, and you're like, whoa. What, uh, Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Funny though, everything's the opposite. You're limited to drinking. Oh, I want you to drink six bottles of water a day. You know, it's like, yeah. man, it's it's like a hundred degree turnaround. But okay, appreciate it. Thank you. I have a question. Sure. Um, my name is Martini Wilson. I'm in uh, um, dialysis patient at the region in. Uh, Georgia, and I have two questions to ask. One, and it's really, it's almost like his, yes, it's the post 80 degree, 180 degree turn. Creatin levels uh, normally put you on dialysis if you're not any kind of a sports person, but you play high levels of sports. And I was told that your creatin level has to be 11 or lower. And I used to be very active, not necessarily in sports, but I walked, I played softball with the team, um, you know, and my creatine level 
as I started dialysis was 11, and they didn't ask me about that and told me that I had to start dialysis. Well, what should your creatinine levels be after you start dialysis? My nephrologist told me one. A one is somebody who is not on dialysis. If you had one that was 11, that definitely means that you need dialysis. But if you're eating well um, and your, um, your kidneys are already at that level you're, um, where you need dialysis, it's not going to typically go back down. I mean, we see it every once in a while, but um, it's... I was hard. eating well. I drank like eight bottles of water per day. Uh, I ate the salad that happened to be a holiday, and at our house we had everybody come, and my great niece is a baker. So the the sweets she baked were really too sweet because I really wasn't eating sweets then. All I did eat was salads. And, and then, I mean, after I had started dialysis within the first year, Another doctor had taken some tests and told me that I did not need to be on dialysis. And I asked her to write me a letter to take to the dialysis center uh, with her information on it so she could be contacted. And she left her job. So I never got the letter. And now I've been on dialysis five years. My creatinine level is still 11. And I still do eat healthy. Right, but, but obviously the problem is that your kidneys are not filtering out the toxins. That's why you have creatinine and BUN nitrogen in, still in your blood. So that's the measurement used um, to determine that what, what, you know, that people have kidney failure. So that doesn't get better, um, you know, that you kind of the symptoms can be decreased a little bit and we can get rid of some of the toxins in your blood. But truly, three days a week of dialysis probably is about 10% of kidney function, right? So I do do dialysis three days a week. Does that create a level ever lower? Not really, no. No. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. You're no. not alone in thinking that, though, because it's true that we think so much about creatinine prior to dialysis, but so we do have other people ask us that. Okay. My second question is, you know, I noticed that a lot of people on dialysis get, it looks like, liver spots on their body. Well, now, after five years, I'm beginning to get those bumps, and sometimes they drain. And I went to a nephrologist today, and she told me that this was not unusual in kidney patients. She sees this a lot. And sometimes they burst, they're like pimples. They burst and they drain. She said it's going to take years to go away. They're ugly spots. Why do we get those? Well, one of the reasons could be when people have high phosphorus, once, once you know, after beyond dialysis, it can cause calcium to be pulled out from your bones. And that calcium can get deposited on your skin. It can get around your lungs and your arteries. It can cause heart problems, heart attack, stroke, all kind of issues. So, it, and it's called calciphylaxis. So that could be one of the reasons. And again, it's usually when the phosphorus is high, you know, month after month after month, that could cause. What that. was it called? What is it called? Calciphylaxis. Would you spell that for me? Sure. Um, it's C A L C Y. Let me write. I'm trying to write it here so make sure I get the right spelling. It's C A L C Y P H Y L A X I S. Okay. And my phosphorus is uh, for two months 
one month it was uh, 5.1, but it's normally 3.5, so it's normally low. That's good. Low. That's, yeah, that's the but, range we like it. We like it between 3 and 5.5. Right. But yeah. now, why would, if my calcium levels are that in that range, then why would I be getting there? Well, it, that could be um, that could be one of the causes. There could be other things. You know, you, you can ask your doctor to maybe run some tests and kind of figure out what else could be causing it. That's one of the reasons. He told me that he could he would prescribe medicine when I start showing him the first couple of spots, and when it started continuing, and then he told me he would write me a prescription for the medicine, but he's so busy till when he sees me, he's seeing other people, and when he leaves, he, forget, he forgets. So you could call the office and remind the nurses yeah. there, and maybe they can send the prescription to your pharmacy for you. All right. Okay. Those, and there was... Those are my, I'm sorry. Somebody had a question about Valfora. I just want to um, answer that. We do have a number of our patients that are on Valfora. It's an iron, iron base um, binder, and we've had some really good success with it for patients who are compliant. It's a chewable um, binder, so you don't have to drink water with it. Um, and usually they start with taking one with each meal. Um, it has a cherry taste to it, and it seems to do really good for um, binder for um, phosphorus control. It doesn't really increase your iron level, so you know doctors won't have to worry about that um, aspect of it. But we've had some really good success with it. The only contraindication that it has is if you're on Synthroid or any thyroid medication, you can take it. That's really about it. Are there any other questions regarding um, bone mineral health? than your phosphorus or PTH levels. I know before um, I had a raised hand. Um, I think there's no name, but the number is 433-459-5474. Yes, I have one question. Please. Yes, could you explain to uh, everybody on board today what happens when your phosphorus falls too low? Well, that could affect your breathing. It can cause fatigue. Um, I think it can have some heart problems as well. Usually in our patients when it gets really low, it's an indication of um, very poor um, um, food intake, basically. So it definitely can have some issues. It causes issues. I don't know if you... Yeah, add anything to the a, a dynamic bone disease. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I have another question on chat, um, which is, what is the best test to detect calcification in your arteries and organs if you possibly are um, have those un the uncontrolled phosphorus levels? Right. So they can, if they do a CAT scan, they can see calcification on a CAT mm -hmm. scan. Um, arteriograms, um, you know, x-rays, a lot of times with x-rays they can see calcification. Mm -hmm. Are there any indicators that would suggest, um, that would alert a patient to maybe ask for those kinds of tests? So, oh, yeah, so you might start seeing black, like look at yeah. necrotic wounds. Um, and it could be on, anywhere on your skin. Yeah, you would see on your skin, like lesions or that don't heal. Do we have any other questions regarding um, bone health? Yes, ma'am. One, uh, one other question. You just mentioned the lesions. I've noticed that people in the clinic sometimes on the area that your socks normally do, they're dark from there down to their ankles. Is that part of the the signs that you were talking about? Well, that that could be, but it also could be decreased circulation to that extremity. Um, so diabetics and even people with peripheral arterial disease, 
Um, a lot of people, a lot of uh, dialysis patients suffer from um, circulation issues. And you think the further away from your heart your extremity is, you know, you're not getting that tissue perfused with the circulation, so the skin would really get dark. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, actually, I have one um, uh, statement. I, I actually did have very high PTH uh, in the area of 1,100 to 1,300. And uh, we increased my um, Sensipar to 90 milligrams, and now it's completely under control for the past okay. six months. Yeah, we've seen some really good results with Sensipar as well on people who um, take the medication, you know, as they're supposed to. And, you know, a lot of times people need adjusting. We have some patients take up to 180 milligrams. So... Sometimes, you know, in your case, 90 work for some patients any more than just 90. So we see that all the time as well. But that's great, great. that your patient is now meeting. Yeah, oh, that's good awesome. You. Good that's, job. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thanks to um, Shadi Patel. She's my personal, not my personal, <laughs> but my, my work registered dietitian in the Brandywine Home Therapy uh, Clinic. Um, and she, she's fairly new, but doing a great job with our patients. So thanks to Shadi for helping us out today. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> and I guess that'll be it then for today. Chris. Take it away. Um, yes, one question. Thank you all. Uh, how do we get a hold of the dietitian? Are you, are you at a dialysis clinic? Yes. There should. I have a dietitian, but if we have any further questions, how do we get a hold of your dietitian? Yeah. I mean, I can write down my email if you guys want to contact me if you have any questions. I don't mind. I'd like it. I'd like it, please. Absolutely. I'm running it right now. So if you guys have any questions, I'll go ahead and I'll copy it and I'll send it to you. Okay. Me? You're to, is yes. that Chrissy? Okay. Yes, it is. Thank you, Chrissy. No problem. You know who I am? Sure do. Okay. Thank you. I was late joining the call. I had a doctor's appointment. No worries. Thanks for joining anyway. Um, I just sent you that email, Mikey, so that you know, address is in your inbox. Um, if there aren't any other right. questions, thank you all for joining. Uh, thank you. Yes, the gentleman who is on the line who asked the question about fast food is still there. Uh, I know you didn't get a chance to provide your email. 